Okay, we've started now. So, hello, welcome to the show. It's great to have you over here. Just to give the viewers a brief introduction of yours, Dr. Skrupina, David Skrupina is uh, a philosopher. He has a background in mathematics and has lectured in many universities, most uh, recently, uh, University of Michigan, Durban. And uh, it's like, there are a lot of things to talk about with Dr. Skarbina because of uh, the controversial views that he has when it comes to uh, technological society or panpsychism or uh, the mythicist view of Jesus. So I hopefully will touch on some of them uh, today. So let's start with your views about, let's start with a bit of your background because that is very interesting. How did you come about from a sort of STEM mathematics field? Was it, the, was it your apprehension about technology or was it just your philosophy? Yeah, thanks. Um, right, so I have a sort of a scientific background. As I say, my uh, master's degree was in mathematics. Um, so I was always curious about uh, technology. I was quite familiar with it in college. Um, uh, always a little bit concerned about the effect on people and on society in a sort of a vague way. Uh, then I then I uh, ran into a particular professor there at, at the University of Michigan. His his name was Henrik Skalomowski, and he was a philosopher of technology and an environmental philosopher. And he was one of the early critics or skeptics about technology in society uh, from a philosophical standpoint. And I got to know him quite well, and was uh, familiar with his writings. And he he pointed me on to other sort of works by uh, Jacques Ellul and. Mumford and Illich, who are also critical of technology. So I was quite quite aware for a long time from early days in college about problems with technology, how it tends to run out of our control, <clears throat> tends to cause problems to, in, in society to humans, it causes psychological stress, cause physical problems, it damages nature. Um, so I was long aware of these problems. Um, really kind of developed, continued to develop my own views over time. Um, eventually it sort of culminated in, uh, in my teaching a course on philosophy of technology at the University of Michigan when I started teaching there in 2003. And so I created a course there. I created a, a textbook to go with my course. And ultimately I published my own book, Metaphysics of Technology with Rutledge in 2015. And that was sort of my own critique. It's quite quite a serious critique of technological society. Uh, interesting. So, was how did Ted Kaczynski, Doctor Kaczynski, came into the picture? Did he influence you in way or were you sort of aware of the? Uh, did you have already have uh, formed your views on the critique of, on the critique of technology, or was Ted Kaczynski sort of? influential in that. So what inspired, uh, what led you to the work of Kaczynski? Was it the events happening around? Yes, so right. So this was the Unabomber story. This was uh, back oh. in the early 1990s. A and uh, I, I remember it very well. So it was, a, it was, a, it was a, a story of mail bombs being sent to individuals. And eventually, the, there was a connection to some writings by this person or group who was sending these bombs uh, that, that uh, it was a kind of an anti-technology manifesto and they wanted it published and then they would stop sending the bombs if they could get this document published. And, it was, and they would release little pieces, small pieces of this document and it was quite interesting. It was, it was quite a well-written, just the small paragraphs, quite a well-written critique. So eventually in, in 1995, the, the government agreed and they uh, agreed to the, the Unabomber's terms and they published this manifesto uh, by the name of Industrial Society in its Future. 
Uh, about six months later in mid 1996, uh, through a long process, uh, I won't go into it, but it led to his capture. And then we found out his name was Ted Kaczynski. He was a former mathematics professor. He had actually gone to my own university, which was the University of Michigan. That was quite surprising. Um, and then we had a chance, of course, at that time to know who the man was. And we could read the entire manifesto. And it was, it was quite an interesting document, really well-written, good arguments. Um, I, I don't think that this influenced me so much. Uh, I just found it interesting because I was already familiar with all the arguments at this time. Uh, many of the ideas had come from Jacques Ellul and some earlier writings uh, that, that Kaczynski had, had, had taken from and had reconfigured these ideas. So I was aware of the arguments. I was already critical towards technology before I even heard of uh, Ted Kaczynski. But it was interesting to see the same ideas presented in, in a new form and, and especially with the controversy of this, of this uh, case of this Unabomber. Uh, eventually, when I was started to teach the course at the university, um, I wanted to include some material from him in my course. So I started writing letters to him to see if I could get some thoughts, some recent ideas and, and so forth. And he was actually responding to me. So I was, I was quite surprised. So we started a long process of letters back and forth. Eventually, I don't know, 120 letters or something like this over time. Uh, a, a long series of letters talking about technology, philosophy of technology, how to respond, the nature of revolutionary action versus reform action and so forth. Um, eventually this led to its own book. So Kaczynski published his own book called Technological Slavery. Originally came out in 2010 in the United States um, as a first edition. Then there was a second edition that was published a few years ago. <clears throat> um, and, and a large portion of that book is actually letters to me. So it, he included in his book <clears throat> several pages, about 100 pages of the letters that he wrote back to me in response to my uh, comments and questions. So it was quite, quite an interesting exchange that we did over many years. So while you were doing the collaboration, did it strike you as this kind of uh, dilemma that you're collaborating with someone who has been convicted of such terrible acts like was it difficult to sort of separate the ideas from the uh, crime itself because um, you know Derrida for instance pointed out that you cannot separate the ideas uh, from the author's biography that they're somehow somewhat inextricable and in this case especially when the author is alive and you're helping uh, essentially convicted there is propagating ideas so to find that difficult to demonstrate uh, it would happen technically that you know if the ideas should hold up for themselves even if it comes from a source uh, that is that we don't you know want to accept well, right. So this is always a problem, right? Of course, he has this uh, notorious background. He was co convicted of these crimes. Um, so yeah, I mean, it obviously it causes problems. I, I, I don't support the crimes. I don't, I don't condone them. And I've always criticized them. And of course, you know, he, he was caught, he was put on trial, and he was punished for the crimes. So um, I mean, this, this is just standard justice. So, um, but I guess the, the point is uh, the real, the basic argument is really distinct from the crimes. Um, as he told us himself, he committed the crimes to gain the reputation to where he could force the publication of this manifesto in, in a large public setting. And so uh, it was a kind of a unique situation for him to, 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 to do this, to get to, the, to get to the point where he had the influence to, to create a big sensation and to, and to cause this document to be published. So the arguments, then the writings in there are, are really completely separate. So, I mean, yes, so some people don't wanna talk about the ideas at all because they connect it to his crimes. For me, I, I'm willing to separate those two because I see those as distinct things. Um, you know, the crimes is, is, a, is, is of course, uh, terrible, and he was, he was punished for those. But we, but we still have the arguments, and the arguments are still there. The technological society is still progressing. It's still getting worse. The problems are compounding. 
And unless we talk about these serious criticisms, uh, we're just we're just harming ourselves. We're we're doing no good for ourselves or for our, for our future generations or for the planet. Um, it's it's an important topic that topic that needs to be discussed. So, I mean, we can talk about them, you know, uh, independent of the background that it caused those documents to emerge. I mean, the same thing with uh, with a French uh, philosopher like Jacques Ellul. I mean, he's also a Catholic theologian, and he was a critic of technological society. Now, personally, I find a lot to criticize about Catholic theologians. I have lots of problems with Christianity. We can maybe talk about the Jesus hoax later on. Um, but, but to me, that's a separate issue from Alul's cr criticism of technology. So even though I might not agree with him on, on his Catholic views, I, I very much agree with his, his criticism of technology. So once again, I, I separate the, the author's personal background or his other views from the specific problems about technology. So I, I think it's a legitimate thing to talk about these, even, even, even in these difficult circumstances. But you've also said before, I think, uh, or you've written, if I remember correctly, that uh, there's nothing much new in Kaczynski's uh, ideas or arguments that he put forth. It has been, you know, many philosophers have argued about it. You elaborate on that in the metaphysics of technology. So why exactly collaborate with uh, someone like Kaczynski when you have, when those ideas are not necessarily new in themselves? So um, I think right, that- well, Right, hmm. right. I mean, that's a good question, right? So the, the, the basic ideas, the arguments have been around for a long time from Alul and Mumford and other people. Um, but they were, but they originally were presented in a very technical academic form. So Elul wrote this uh, really fascinating book called *The Technological Society*. But it's, but it's quite difficult. It's it's quite technical. It's very few people will read it. It's it's a thick book, and there's a lot of details in it, and uh, it's just not the kind of book that that lots of people will read. It's only for sort of students and the university and professors. So what Kaczynski did, he did a couple of things. He took these ideas and he put them in a very condensed, simplified, accessible form for the public. So this is sort of one contribution from him. The second contribution is that he, he, he takes sort of a more radical view where he says, well, look, really we have, the system cannot be fixed. It cannot be reformed. Uh, there's no way to, to, to solve the problems. We have to get rid of the system. This is the revolutionary aspect. And, um, and this was, I think that in a, in a sense, this was new. This was a kind of a contribution where he was very blunt and very clear, we have to end the system. The sooner the better, because we have no better option. All the reform options will fail. Um, so none of the previous critics had really talked about it in, in, in quite so uh, blunt and explicit so, sort of way. So, so at least in those two ways, I mean, he was an important uh, sort of new contribution to this discussion. And plus just the, just the publicity of the whole situation that he was in, this, this brings in a, a, an opportunity um, to talk about it in, in more of a current context. So Elul, for example, is, is long dead. His original book was written in 1954. So it's, you know, 70 years ago now. And it's, it seems to be quite, you know, it looks quite old, but the Kaczynski critique is, is relatively new. It's very clear. It's very uh, relevant. And uh, it, it's, a good, it's a good opportunity to, to discuss these ideas in, in a new light. Now we'll of course discuss whether you agree with those two points or not, but before we do that, I want you to briefly explain what exactly is the philosophy of technology. What is the philosophy of technology? Right. Well, I, I mean, you can ask sort of what is the philosophy of, any, of anything, right? So really, to me, you want to know sort of what this thing really is that you're dealing with, right? So, so you want to try to describe its essential characteristics, how it really functions, you know, what it's made of in some sense, right? How, how is the system or process constructed? How does it operate in the world? And maybe how should we respond to it if, if there's a problem or a threat? Um, to me, these are all sort of baked into the, the metaphysics or even the ethics of whatever topic we, we care to discuss. So technology, 
uh, for instance, is, is a very interesting uh, uh, phenomenon in itself because it, it seems to be individual things like a cell phone and a computer and a car or, a, or a, an airplane or something. But really it's a kind of a complete system. It's a whole integrated system where all the parts and all the processes of one are sort of connected to the parts and processes of others. And we have a very sort of an integrated process which seems to be developing, it kind of re really develops on its own and it's sort of at its own pace and at, at an accelerating pace, uh, arguably in a way that we do not even control and certainly in a way that poses great, great dangers to humans and to, to nature. Um, one thing that struck me when I was sort of studying this, this philosophy of technology is when you go back in time and you, you can go back hundreds of years or thousands of years. You can go back to the ancient Greeks. You can go back to Plato and Aristotle. And you can even very simple technology, which was what existed, you know, 2,500 years ago. And even then they were, they were very skeptical. They, were, they sort of dismissed it. They, the people who were the technicians back then were, were considered sort of the lower class individuals. And they, they said, well, no, no real citizen would want to be a, they, they use the word a mechanic, right? A mechanical person who makes things, makes tools and machines and simple machines and, and, and devices. And they said, well, who would want to do this? This is not, this is not a, an uplifting noble life. This is sort of a lowly, uh, just a low class sort of life. So it was kind of interesting. Even back then, they understood that the people who make these things aren't, it's not really a, a noble kind of uplifting sort of life. We want to be sort of contemplating, thinking, artistic, creative people, and technology opposes these things in, in human beings. And you see throughout history for, for the preceding centuries, you see increasingly harsh criticisms of machines and machine society and what they do to people and how they control us and how they manipulate us. It's really striking, even, even you know two and three centuries ago, Prior to electricity, even I mean, you see, there's this, you know, very early industrial revolution era, and 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 people are looking at what's going on and they're saying this is not good. This is leading to something bad. The machines are evolving very quickly. Um, you know, it, it's really striking how 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 perceptive these uh, thinkers were in the past to to this phenomenon, this 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 thing called technology, right? And you really get the idea that there is. There is some kind of a metaphysical basis to this thing. It's, it's a kind of an independent process, or maybe even a, a kind of, as I've argued in my book, it's a kind of a natural process that we do not really control. Uh, maybe we do not, do not really even understand it in some sense, um, but it seems to operate sort of as a larger force in nature, and, and uh, it, does not, it does not have good implications for us, the way things are progressing. Now, most people think that uh, technology is in itself is not a bad thing, that uh, it's the people who do bad things with technology. It's the people who, uh, you know, make nuclear bombs or uh, create diseases, vaccine, uh, coronavirus, or things like that, lab-made diseases. It's actually in the hands of people that technology, you know, weapons and everything. Uh, are used for human destruction. The same technology can be used when good people use it for human for human well-being. So, do you find that argument? Uh, because you have, I think, argued against this point in your book, uh, the metaphysics of technology. So, what exactly is your objection to that uh, point? Well, right. This is this is a, a common response when you want to criticize technology, and it's called the uh, the argument of neutrality. So people, just as you said, people say, "Well, look, the technology itself is neutral. It's not good. It's not bad. It's just it's just a thing. It's like a tool, like a hammer or a saw or a screwdriver. It's just a thing. And if you use it properly, and good things will happen. If you use it to commit a crime, well, then bad things will happen." Um, and it, I mean, in the face of it, it seems, it seems true. It seems obvious. Well, yes, tools are just tools and it depends on how you use them. But if you, if you press into it deeper and you sort of ask deeper questions and you look at how it really functions in the world, um, we really find out that this is not true. It's actually uh, one, of the, one of the surprises, I think, when you study philosophy of technology is, is that we realize that it's not neutral 
in any practical sense, in any meaningful sense. It's not really neutral. And in fact, what I mean, it's surprising when you study, again, philosophers over, over, over the decades and even the centuries, when they have analyzed technology in their own time, there's been a very common thread through, through many, many years. And the philosophers have, have consistently come to the conclusion that technology is not neutral, that it's not just an arbitrary thing. It has a, uh, it has a, a process and, and, and a force behind it. It has a kind of sense of imperatives. It has values attached to it. Um, as I've argued, right, if, if technology was really neutral, then you would expect certain things to be true. So for example, its use would be optional. And, and we know that in uh, sort of in any meaningful sense, technology is really not optional at all in present day society. If, if you want to do anything today, almost anything in modern society, to, to talk to people, to go somewhere, to hold a job, to go to school, to, do, to travel, I mean, to do anything, you're using advanced technology, whether you want to or not. Technically, of course, I guess you can say, well, look, I can go live in the woods and I can get away from everything and I can do nothing. But then you've completely isolated yourself from the entire world, from the entire society. So, so to simply to be engaged with people in the world today, because it is a technological society, you're forced to use these things. If you want to have a job, if you want to go to school, if you want to see your friends, you are forced to use them, right? Um, I mean, that's just one point, right? You, if, if technology is neutral, you should have understand the risks. You should understand the consequences. They should be, uh, technology should lead to a net benefit because if we create devices for our benefit, they should lead to positive outcomes in general. But but we see that that's really not true. We, we see um, that things have very mixed outcomes and sometimes the negative outcomes are worse than the positive outcomes were, were good. Um, the argument that I like to sort of give is, as we know that all studies of human health, psychological health and physical health are in decline around the world, you know, east and west, everywhere. If you look at the statistics on human well-being, it's, it's in decline. And you say, but wait a minute, we have increasingly good technology. We have better diagnosis, we have better medical technologies, we have new drugs, we have new treatments. Our health should be progressing, it should be getting better constantly. But it doesn't, it gets worse. Why is that? It's because the technology is not neutral. It does not operate in our best interest. It operates against our best interest. You could make the same argument with nature. You could say, well, look, we have technologies that are good for nature. We have uh, solar cells and we have wind turbines and we have you know, clean technology and we have electric cars and, and, we can, and we can study animals much better. And we have satellites that can study ecosystems and we can you know, protect animals in laboratories. And, well, you know, if, if technology was good for nature, then nature should be getting better. The, the, the planet should be getting healthier and cleaner and more species. But no, what do we see? We see the planet is on the decline. We're losing species, it's getting more pollution, there's more dangerous, more toxins, more radiation. Everything gets worse. Why is that? Because technology is not neutral. It's not for the benefit of nature. It's not for the benefit of humans. It harms these things. That's because it operates in its own, with its own imperatives and its own ends, which are not our ends, it operates against us. To me, that's the strongest argument that overall, the whole phenomenon of technology is definitely not neutral. So um, I'm really more interested in that analytical argument of how technology has, or whether it really has harmed human health and uh, created more diseases and well-being. So, uh, um, you know, this conversation would be incomplete if we don't talk about Steven Pinker, so we'll come to him sooner. But uh, first, as you mentioned, the uh, you know diseases technology has also helped us eradicate uh, many diseases. Smallpox, for instance, was eradicated in a span of uh, fifty years in the nineteen eighties, and uh, polio is on decline. So, vaccine is in. Uh, has helped us eradicate many epidemic diseases, has helped us uh, uh, stop pandemics. So what is your response to that? Sure, well, of course, right? It, it has solved certain problems, but it has created new problems. And in fact, it has created more problems than it has solved. This is my claim. So even though it has eliminated a handful of diseases from humanity, it has created new diseases. So we, we you know, um, yeah, I mean, there's new, there's new um, 
because of our interactions, because of high-speed transportation system, because we're pressing into the wilderness areas and we're coming into contact with animals that and, and that we that we would not have had before, because we live in very high-density cities where we exchange these viruses and the and the bacteria among ourselves. Um, we've created the conditions from a technological society that allow new uh, pathogens to emerge and to spread very rapidly and to cause great damage. Um, I mean, you know, I, we, well, we have SARS and we have AIDS and we have, you know, a bird flu and swine flu. And I mean, we can talk about lots of these diseases that really did not exist uh, in previous decades and, and really came about because of the technological processes, either animal agriculture or, as I said, pressing into wilderness and, and, and high density cities and these kind of things that have really, that really promoted these germs. I mean, take something like the, uh, the COVID virus which is still actually still unknown. We don't really know uh, where this came from, right? I mean, there's some discussion, did it come from the nature? Did it come from the laboratory in China? Was it actually made in the laboratory in China and then escaped or was it released? Was it made in the United States? And then we sent it there and infected people there? Oh yeah, we don't know. Um, but it seems like the evidence seems like it was manipulated using advanced technology in a laboratory and then either escaped or was released on purpose. So the, the mere fact that people can now genetically manipulate and create new stronger viruses, that, that completely negates the benefit of, well, okay, we got rid of smallpox and we got rid of polio and a couple of other things. But, but now the, 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 you know, the, the box is open to all kinds of new horrible diseases uh, which you know researchers can create in, in laboratories and you know militaries can use for bioweapons. Uh, we, we've only begun to see the problems of technological diseases, which I'm I, I'm sure will be far worse than the natural diseases that we eliminated. Well, uh, I'm not really sure whether the diseases that you mentioned did not exist before the uh, so-called technological society. I think that they were not identified. So for instance, we have examples of mental disorders, which, uh, you know, probably people like Van Gogh probably had bipolar disorder, but at that time, we did not have the sort of knowledge to diagnose, there was no such thing as bipolar disorder. So I think that uh, in a lot of these instances, these diseases uh, did exist, but they were not identified because we did not have sufficient technology to identify them. So uh, well, that's certainly possible. Um, what, from what we've know, though, the prevalence of these diseases was much less the further back we go in time. So, I mean, you, we can take examples like Van Gogh or people. I mean, this is still within the industrial age. So I think it's not surprising. We see an increase in mental illnesses from the mid-1700s. So to really see... Um, I mean, and other things too. We talk about obesity and 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 uh, you know other uh, depression and other uh, you know uh, other other pathologies, mental mental illnesses, really really are on the increase from the 17 1800s. Um, I, I know there's a couple of studies who looked at sort of the writings of ancient Greece and Rome, and and they determined that the what we call depression almost did not exist. It was almost non-existent in those times. So people were angry or they were sad or they were disappointed. But what we call depression, this clinical disease uh, of depression, which affects something like 10% of all Americans. I mean, there's millions of people just in my country alone that have, have suffered from depression. It almost did not exist in ancient times. The same thing with cancer. For example, we, we, we know how dangerous cancer is in the modern age. If you look back to ancient times and into and hunter-gatherer era, uh, cancer was almost non-existent. I mean, the, the, you know, the Greeks invented the, the word cancer, it's a Greek word, but it was so rare, it was so unusual, they gave it a special name because they, had never, they almost never had seen it. There's, you get a tumor on your body and they, and they, and they gave it this name of cancer. So, so there are many diseases and I, and I document a lot of these in my book that that, that simply either did not exist or were very, very minor uh, occurrences in ancient times. It's, it was not just a matter of diagnosis. I think in absolute terms, things were much, many of these problems were much, much lower uh, hundreds of years ago than they are today. So that suggests that modern society is increasing or causing these, these, these problems, depression, obesity, psychosis, cancer, 
uh, attention deficit disorder, I mean, addiction problems, a lot of these things we have good reason to think uh, come from technological sources. Um, well, let's say that, uh, take the example of something like uh, homosexuality. So we have very little text from the ancient world uh, written by people who were openly homosexual because homosexuality was persecuted. It, did not, it does not mean that uh, gays did not exist or members from the LGBT community did not exist. It, it's just that there was a societal stigma which prohibited them from expressing themselves. In the case of these diseases, it might have been, we do not have data we did then like we do now, we do not have these sort of same sort of statistics. We have to you know, look back on it very differently right. based sure. on literary texts. So can you really say with any kind of certainty that these did not exist? Because I think that is mere uh, speculation at this point. Well, right. So some of it is speculation. I mean, we try to make it well-informed speculation. Um, I mean, a couple of things I would say. So take cancer, for example. Cancer, when you get a tumor on your body, in your, let's say in your arm, it leaves an abrasion, a mark on the bone. And you can see it in the bones. And I know anthropologists have studied bones from ancient peoples, from caves and you know, cemeteries and so forth. And they are looking for these marks on the bones that indicated a cancerous tumor. And it, they, it's almost non-existent. Uh, I've read some studies where they said they cannot find any or maybe one or two cases out of you know, thousands of bones that they've looked at. They, they simply can't find it. So they see no evidence in ancient humans of these cancerous tumors that would leave a mark on the bone. So, I mean, that's a pretty objective sort of data that, that we have. Um, the psychological ones, as you say, are harder because of diagnosis and because of social stigma. But I mean, even forgetting that, just go back 10 or 20 or 30 years, we've seen tremendous increases in these problems in just the past you know, few decades when we've gone from, you know, and it wasn't that long ago. So I, I can easily remember right back in the mid 90s, even before the time of say Ted Kaczynski. I mean, there was no cell phones, there was really no internet, there was no social media. Uh, I mean, things were technologically much less advanced. And, and now these things have exploded in the, in the past say 30, 30 years or so, 25 or 30 years. And we've seen parallel rises in many of these psychological uh, and, and uh, even physical problems in, in people, particularly young people. So I think even today we can correlate the, the, these problems with technological causes just in the data from the past, past few decades. So we don't really need to go back 3000 years. We can just look at the data in recent years and we can see the problems as well. Right, so I think now we should talk about Steven Pinker, uh, who has written a 800 page long book saying that uh, society is in fact improving and uh, leading towards the progress. Now that he is of course writing from the analytic tradition, but even from the metaphysical one, uh, you know, you can talk about Hegel's idea that uh, people are going towards enlightenment or Marx idea that society always inevitably goes towards, you know, progress and that all of these are simply stages leading up to that progress. So in that sort of uh, enlightenment tradition, Steven Pinker argues that uh, society is getting better uh, and citing facts, uh, one of which uh, some of them, for instance, are that uh, in 1990, 36% of people were living in extreme poverty. And now that number is just uh, 30%. Uh, in 30 years ago, there were around 23 ongoing wars. Now there are just 10. There were 60,000 uh, weapons, nuclear weapons 30 years ago. Now there are 10,000 nuclear weapons. So when you're talking about these facts, uh, how are you going to argue that, uh, you know, society is actually getting worse and that these are, how are you going to refute uh, these facts, which is that human child mortality has decreased, infant mortality, uh, maternal mortality has decreased, and uh, uh, birth rate has decreased, all of these, you know, facts right. which are generally accepted. 
Right. Well, right. So, uh, of course, some things have increased. You can it's a question of whether that's an improvement or a gain or not. So we can talk about what has increased. So te technological products has obviously increased. So more knowledge, more information, more communications, more transportation, uh, entertainment, right? So all these things have clearly increased over, let's say, 100 years, just not to go back too far, say from 1920 to 2020. Um, so material wealth has increased, uh, certainly for the, the people at the top, but let's say even most many people. You could say, yes, the percentage of wars are down or the percentage of people involved in wars have decreased or wars have become less deadly in terms of percent of population and so forth. I think uh, Pinker makes some of these arguments. Um, so there's, there's no doubt that some of these things have increased. Uh, infant mortality is down. Um, but of course, global population is up hugely. It's, it's exploded in the, in the, in the past uh, few hundred years. Um, so, I mean, you know, okay, so what, what do you say about that? You know, if, uh, I, I don't know the numbers offhand. I, I think 100 years ago, we had maybe, what, 6 billion people, and today we're almost 8 billion people, or maybe it was 5 billion. I mean, it's gone up just in the past century uh, uh, by a huge amount. And you could say, well, look, there's more people, there's more children, there's more babies, isn't this nice? You could call that better. Um, but if you look at sort of the overall condition of the planet and where we're heading, the long-term trends, the sustainability of the human race and the sustainability of the planet, I think are undoubtedly in decline. And they have been for, for many centuries. So, so we're on a short-term uh, rise of affluence and numbers, but these, these cannot be sustained. So um, I guess this is sort of the basic argument. Yeah, yes, short term, meaning decades or even, even a century, you can sustain a, a short term growth of prosperity and human numbers and so forth. Um, but in the end, these, uh, the argument I've made and others made is that this, this is going to lead to a much larger catastrophe in the end. And we are in no position today to judge these gains from the past 10 or 20 or 30 or 50 or 100 years. It's too early. Uh, Pinker cannot really make his argument. All he can say is, well, today, yeah, sure, today, it seems like it's better than yesterday and better than 10 years ago and better than 20 years ago. But, but we don't have the perspective to make a true judgment. We have to wait another 100 years or another 200 years. And then we will see, right? If the, if the human population, which is going up to 8 billion and then maybe to 10 billion, and then we have some dramatic catastrophe and then it, and then it cra cr crashes to 1 billion, which could well happen, it could, we could be at 1 billion before the end of this century quite easily. So then we say, well, look, what were all those great, those great products that kept babies alive and sort of kept mothers alive and made, made people healthier? that allowed the population to explode only to cause it to crash and billions of people to die in a very short period of time. What, what was the net benefit of that? And I think, I think the, anybody who's left alive will say it was horrible. It was, a, it was a terrible disaster. We outstripped the ability of the planet to, 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 to uh, support this species, the human species. Well, I've done some research on the human numbers. The, the planet can only handle maybe I mean, it's really very small numbers. I don't know, maybe maybe a couple of few hundred million total human beings on the planet are probably long-term sustainable, maybe 1 billion if we really are sort of careful and smart about it. But there's in no sense as six or eight or 10 billion people, it's simply impossible to sustain them. There will be a complete collapse of the global ecosystem, uh, of the human population numbers, of lots of other animals will also go extinct because of us. And what we're doing, so it's uh, it's it's far too early to make these uh, these rosy predictions like Pinker and others do. They're in no position to make a judgment yet. Um, well, I would say the same about you because we are in a position to only speculate based on the facts that we have. Uh, what is going to happen? Obviously, we can make a well-informed speculation, as you have um, said yep. before. Uh, but I want to understand because a lot of people do make a distinction between modern technology and technology in general. So technology in general would include lots of things, including pen and all of these things. So uh, for many, modern technology is uh, uniquely evil, but uh, for others, it is uh, the essence of technology sort of remains same. You know, Heidegger argued 
that the essence of technology has always remained the same. So is your opposition only to modern technology or is it to technology in general? Well, right. So this is another good philosophical question because people make sometimes try to make a sharp divide between what they call modern technology and pre-modern or simpler technology. It's actually very hard philosophically to make a sharp boundary because technology is a continuous progression along a spectrum. So it's very hard to pick a point in time and say, well, this point in time, everything after this is modern and everything before it is, is pre-modern. In my book, in the Metaphysics of Technology, I've argued that it's a continuous process. Really, it's a, a kind of a continuum or a spectrum. And it's really a false distinction to kind of try to make a sharp line uh, here. So I think that really does, does not work, at least philosophically or metaphysically, that does not work. Um, but, but that said, more recent technologies are more potent and they're more energetic and therefore they are more dangerous than other technologies. Also, we have to recognize that humans, homo sapiens have never lived without any technology. I mean, we always had, we always had simple things, you know, stone, stone tools and stone axes and we had sticks and simple clothing. Okay, so these were simple technologies, but they were sustainable. So that was not the problem. It's, it's not a problem of eliminating all technology. It's getting from a high level, advanced, dangerous, uncontrollable level of technology down to something that is sustainable, manageable, and controllable. So in, in my book and in sort of my recent writings, I said, well, look, we certainly can recognize some things are completely unsustainable. So electronic devices, really anything electric driven is unsustainable, fossil fuels, are an unsustainable source of power because they're running out, they create pollution, they're dangerous, they're, they're toxic. So any long-term vision of human, human nature has to do without electricity, without fossil fuels. So I've argued that, look, we need, to, we need to plan to take us back, sort of in a sense, back in time to simpler technologies prior to electricity, prior to fossil fuels, uh, back to the time of, say, the Renaissance in Europe, I've argued for something like, uh, you know, we're in the 13th century, say around the year 1200. Very simple technologies compared to today. Um, no fossil fuels, no electricity, obviously, in the 1200s. Uh, but still, it was possible to create a very high level of culture and society. And we know because we can see the results of uh, the Renaissance Europe. They, they created the uh, the Notre Dame Cathedral was built in 1250 or something. I mean, it was a tremendous accomplishment and it, it was nothing than stones and guys were just chipping and chisels and they, they, and they were able to construct this thing. So uh, we could have tremendously high quality of life with very simple technology that will be sustainable probably for a very long time. So to me, that's the important thing. We need to get, if you wanna call that pre-modern, that's okay get to a, tech, a level of technology that does not use technology, that does not use electricity, does not use fossil fuels, and then learn how to make a society that will sustain you that way. And that's probably our best hope as, as a human race. Well, that will also stop us from um, doing say, scientific research. So we would not be able, you know, without the technological tools, we wouldn't have been able to know about or verify the theory of evolution, or uh, talk about historical events. Uh, you know, so for these, for scientific research in particular, we absolutely need technology. So, do you think that we should stop our endeavor to explore further, to explore space, and you know, just figure well, it out? Right. Well, first of all, a lot of those things actually came out of the ancient Greek era. And a lot of people don't realize this, theories of atoms, theories of evolution, theories about chemical elements, these came in ancient Greece, and they were just using by their, their rationality. And they came to these conclusions in four or 500 BC. So it did not take advanced technological devices to come up with these ideas. Just intelligent it thinking people. It help in proving the, uh, you know, the theory of evolution was not proven in the Greek era. It was proven later on when we had the technology exactly. to evaluate the fossil system. Well, well, exactly, right. So you have to do carbon dating, right? And you have to ex get to the fossil record and these kind of things. But okay, but it's been done. Even if we want to say, well, look, we, we did it. We, 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 have, we know how to, uh, we have the data about fossils and we know about sort of geology, geological history. Um, if, if you sort of 
now say, look, we need to survive, you can still keep the knowledge. We still have the knowledge about how the planet evolved in the universe and how the dinosaurs existed. And you know, you still have books, even if you were to go back to say the 1200s, you, you don't forget everything. You have the knowledge that you've acquired. You, you write them in books. Okay, you don't have laser printed books. You have to go to hand printed books. Well, that's what we did back then, right? Uh, but you still had books, but people could write, you read and write and they had pen, pen, pen and paper and, and so forth. So you don't lose the knowledge that you have now. We know about germs. We know about how the human body works. We know about you know disinfectants. Uh, I mean, you know, you we know that alcohol, you know, is a treatment for certain infections and so forth. We know we have a lot of information now that could be used in a very simple society that would be very beneficial, and we could have many of the benefits that we have today, including the knowledge benefits. But but we but we but we survive. So we get rid of all the, the dangerous sources, the, the potent new technologies that that could very well wipe us out. So so we, we in a sense we can have we can have both. We're in a very good position. We can retain the knowledge that we have, and yet get us to, on a sustainable track. It's possible to do that now. If we wait another twenty or thirty years, it may not be possible anymore. So one of the uh, things, arguments that I've listened to from opponents of technology is that without technology, human creativity would sort of explode and increase and would be able to do, you know, more creative works and whether it's literature or whatever. But uh, in case of music, we would lose a great deal. Uh, I mean, guitars, uh, they use electricity, but you lose the beaters, you lose the Rolling Stones. So uh, <laughs> you'd lose a lot of genres, hip hop or jazz, or a lot of these things. So do you really think that uh, those genres are harming human beings? Because I think that they're at the pinnacle of uh, creativity. Well, right. So the, the technological devices allow different forms of creativity because you have new tools and ways of expression, right? So you can create new kinds of music or new kinds of artwork, for example, or, or you know, special effects and motion pictures, right? You can do these things with advanced technology. Um, yeah, okay. So, so we lose some of these things. I mean, to me, these are, these are trivial losses compared to survival of the planet and humanity. I mean, you know, even if you say, oh, I really love, you know, the, the, you know, electronic music or rap music. Well, okay. I mean, to me, it's, to me, it's like horrible. So to me, this is a, nothing but a benefit to get rid of it completely. But, but, you know, I understand some people like it. Right. So, um, but, but, well, okay. So look, so that you have to do the trade-off, you know, do you, do you want to keep these nice little, these nice little comforts and benefits that you like, but you put the whole planet at risk. And I think any reasonable person has to say, well, look, it's, it's just not worth it to do that. So from the perspective of, uh, you know, from the environmental perspective, um, would we be able to live in a sort of vegan society in a like society which is not technologically adept? Because I think that is also going to be a bit of a problem. To be vegan. Hmm. Well, right. So in a simpler society, you're going to have small scale agriculture, right? So we, there will be no industrial agriculture uh, and small scale agriculture, it does not necessarily have to be vegan. Of course, we know that meat and dairy are very damaging for the planet, right? I think this is becoming quite well known. And, and when you have six or 8 billion people and they want to eat meat and have uh, dairy products, that this, is, this rapidly destroys the, the whole planet. Now, if we could get to a sustainable population let's say 100 million humans, much lower than today, uh, living uh, very local with their local productions of their local products and local food sources. Uh, you could probably have some, some small scale animal agriculture. You could have you know, chickens producing eggs and you could milk goats and, 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 and cows, I suppose. Cows are quite damaging environmentally, but you could have some small scale um, you know, uh, um, meat and dairy production, if you had a small population that was basically living sustainably within the, uh, within the capacity of their local environment. So it's, it's not a necessity that you go 100% vegan. Today, it's obviously a big benefit because it helps sustain the planet, but, uh, but you would have choices. This, the smaller the population, the more choices in a sense you have because you're not putting yourself and the planet at risk. 
Today, almost everything that we do puts the planet at risk. So we have to be very careful about what we do as a human, as a human species. So how exactly are you going to approach this and present a pragmatic solution? Because you are clearly in the minority. Most people think that technology, you know, they might agree with you on specific things. They might agree that nuclear disarmament is the bad thing. They might agree that we should stop artificial intelligence research. They might agree on the, you know, recently the COVID gain of function research, but they, they, they will not never agree uh, to go back to the 13th century because that is more difficult. And how are you, like, what is your pragmatic solution? What is your pragmatic groundwork for this? Well, that's true, right? So this is kind of an extreme solution and very few people are talking about it. Um, <clears throat> so my approach is just, just to make the case today to try to educate people on the risks and dangers and to give a plausible roadmap to get there. <clears throat> so of course, if, if we said, well, look, we need to do it in one year and we need to go back to you know 1200s or something. I mean, this would be catastrophic, right? It would be, everything would be collapsing and shut down and lots of people would die. Uh, I have argued, I said, well, look, we have time. Let's do it slowly and gradually over time. Let's take a long time. Let's say 100 years. Let's take a whole century to slowly simplify our technological system to get back to where we were in the 1200s, in the 13th century. If you do it slowly and gradually, <clears throat> it's, it's, it's manageable, it's relatively painless, it's relatively uh, uh, controllable, you know, it's, not, it's not catastrophic for humanity. We can slowly reduce our numbers, we can slowly reduce our, our, our tools and our, reduce our impact on nature. At the same time, if you allow nature to, 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 to expand and to thrive, create more wilderness areas, then the planet can heal. Humanity can simplify itself over 100 years. And then we have a plan. We have a roadmap that will take us from where we are today to a sustainable state. And, and for me, so I'm a, a professor or a, a researcher, this is really all that I can do. I'm not a politician. I, I can't make any rules. All I can do is try to educate people and to make the case that this is possible and it can be done and it should be done. And the sooner that we do it, the better. Now today, of course, very few people will, will find that argument convincing, but we just had a huge pandemic which killed, uh, I don't know how many millions of people around the, around the globe. And if we find out that this pandemic was caused by a, a, a virus created in a laboratory, now people are starting to think, well, wait a minute, advanced technologies are creating diseases which are killing millions of people. And this was a very small crisis. The next one will be a much bigger crisis. So we need to be ready for this one. We don't know what it will be. The next crisis could be another pandemic. It could be some kind of terrorist technological attack. It could be artificial intelligence that, that goes out of control. It could be uh, internet or power systems collapse. I think people will be much more open to my argument in the next few years when these next crises will hit and they will hit. It's, a, it's virtually a guarantee that the next ones will be far worse. And then people will start to think, wait a minute, these are technological causes and the problems are getting worse and worse maybe we should think about doing something. And then I would say, well, look, I have some ideas. I've been writing this for you know, 10 years now. Uh, we need to take some kind of action like this to try to, try to avoid the worst possible outcomes. And I, and I think once these next, the next crises hit, I think then people will start to think more seriously about taking action. But we've already had a lot of crises. We have had uh, atom bombs, we have, uh have this pandemic but when these crises happen people usually say that you know we need to stop this one particular thing and not technology as a whole so for instance in this pandemic people are criticizing gain of function research so that might be regulated but technology as a whole remains uh, you know just keeps progressing so um, well, of I don't... course. In fact, in fact, they say we need more technology. When these crises happens, we need more better technology. We need new, new uh, ant antibiotics. We need new vaccines. We need new things that are even better, right? So this is always the response. Every technological problem creates the, the idea that we need a technological solution that's even stronger and more potent technology that will handle the problem that the simpler technology 
created. And this is constant pro process over centuries of the simple technology creates a problem. New technology is supposed to fix the problem, but it leads to different problems. And then we create a new technology for this and a new technology for this, and it just goes on and on. So, um, so far, as bad as nuclear bombs and the COVID crisis, these are really very minor. It's, it's it, you know, how many people died from nuclear bombs? It was only, uh, what was the 100,000 or something in Japan, right? I mean, it's, it's really very small. Even the people who died from COVID, if it's, if it's in the millions, this is, you know, 0.01% of the, of the planet. Uh, that's a relatively small impact. Uh, I think we will see much greater problems in, in the near future, and it, and it could be far greater numbers of people either suffering or dying, and then, and then it will be much harder, uh, harder to make these arguments that, well, we just, we just need to fix this one problem, just fix this one problem, and everything will be okay. That's, that's just not how it works. So one of the arguments that critics of technology have made, uh, Bill Joy has made this, um, quoted the famous paragraph from Kaczynski man, uh, Manifesto, is that um, we're, we're at a point where machines, it's very highly likely that machines are going to sort of control us. And they're not, it's not going to be one day we wake up and the machines are controlling us. It's going to be a very slow, gradual process where human beings become sort of indistinguishable from machines, this sort of emerging happening. And in a situation like this, when that happens, we will not, you know, we will not realize that the machines are actually controlling us. We will be uh, just like, you know, we don't realize that technology, you know, social media and internet and these devices are affecting us and controlling us. So that sort of realization is not going to come when technology progresses and eventually gets worse. So in light of this scenario, would you say that uh, violence is an effective way of achieving the um, technological, the non-technological society that you advocate for? Um, well, well, right. So, so we really do not recognize because it's this very small incremental process by which we we lose control of our lives, and and it's it shows up in different ways. It's it's in things that we we must have to function that we cannot do without that we don't want to do without. Right. So, I mean, I've talked about just just a cell phone, you know, and and uh, I whenever I talk to my students, uh, you know, and I say, well, you know. Uh, you know, wh wh why don't you just do without your cell phone? And they, they're like shocked, like, well, I, I can't do it. What do you mean? I can't do, I can't live without my cell phone. I have to have it. And I say, look, I don't have a cell phone. Even today, I don't have a cell phone. I, I, um, I borrow one in an emergency, but basically I have no cell phone. I don't, I don't have it. I don't carry it. I don't use it. Um, and people are like shocked, like, how can you do that? And I, and I say, because, well, I live my whole life without one until, uh, you know, in the, in the, in the night, uh, 2000s, well, I don't need one now. So, I mean, just, just, just sort of this, the, the psychology of what do you need? I have to have a, a Facebook account. I have to keep up my social media. I have to use Instagram. I mean, you know, these, these things that you feel like there's pressure and you don't, we don't always understand there's social pressure and psychological pressure and you know, sometimes it's it's requirements for school, it's requirements for work, it's optional things like now here we're talking on a Zoom call. Um, you know, all these things we we suddenly we 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 don't even almost realize that we have to use these advanced technologies. Just just it seems to have a normal life, and we don't realize how pervasive they really have become. And I think that's the process by which we lose control. There's more and more things that we have to have that I need to use. I have to have on a regular basis, you know, we can only imagine what will come. It's, it, it, it always, each little step seems to be a relatively small step, maybe even a good thing, right? I mean, it's not obvious when somebody hands you a cell phone, you say, oh, well, that's nice. Oh, it's a nice new cell phone. Oh, look, I can do this. I can take pictures. I can do these things. It seems like a good thing until it finds out that it's a requirement and you have to have this thing and it has a put, imposes a burden on you. Now it's a requirement. Now I needed to contact my friends and my family. So I think it's a very subtle and, and very dangerous process by which in, in these many, many different areas, these, these devices and processes become requirements of our life. And we, 
and we feel like we can't live without them. And in, in that sense, we are being controlled by them. Do you think it's a bit um, hypocritical of you to talk about going to the 13th century and then be using technology? You know, we're now talking on Zoom call. Yeah. Well, well, yeah, I mean, obviously in some sense, right? Because I'm uh, choosing to operate and to live in modern society, to talk to people and to teach. And I, I, yeah, I fly in the airplane and I take my car to this door. I mean, I do all these things um, in, in a, you could say, well, look, okay, he's being a hypocrite because he doesn't really like these things, which is true. Um, but again, I guess the point is I have no choice, right? So my choice is I could, I could drop all these things and I could go to the northern part of Michigan and I could live uh, in a small house, you know, with no electric power and, and no internet and no cell phone and then like talk Tario. to nobody. And, and, and you will, then you will never hear from me again, right? You'll never hear from me again. Or... Or since my job is a communicator and an educator, then I say, well, look, I have to be engaged with people. I have to talk to people like yourself. I have to talk to students. I have to go to a conference. I have to write papers because I think the benefit, yeah, okay, I understand. Yes, I prefer not to do these things. I don't call them being hypocritical. I'm just saying, look, this is the nature of what's required to interact in a modern society. And I have to use these things. I don't like them. I try to keep them to a minimum. I don't use a cell phone. I use email as little as possible. Zoom call as min minimal as possible. Um, but I do what I have to do to, to educate people and to help to help uh, make the case about what's going on. Because I, I guess I think that the benefit is uh, for society somehow outweighs the cost to myself. I think a similar parallel would be uh, that of a communist who lives in a capitalist society and uses the capitalist instruments because society itself, you know, is surrounded by capitalists. So he has to, you know, use that method because, you know, what can, well, the, what else can he do? Exactly. You have, you have professors at university who is anti-capitalist, but he gets paid and he cashes his paycheck every day and he buys a house and he buys a car. Well, okay. Yeah, he's forced to interact in a capitalist system. So in a sense, he has to go along with it. I don't think we can avoid these things. I mean, I, I, it, it does not hold much weight to say, oh, well, he, you know, so-and-so is being hypocritical. If, if you have any standards at all in life and you know that you cannot quite meet those standards because of the reality of the world that you're in, that doesn't, I, I mean, that's, it's an impossible condition. You, you either have to completely, you know, if you want to be pure to your standards, then you have to completely break away from the modern society. And then you have sort of no social existence at all, or you accept the compromises and, and you, and you try to make the case as best you can. So that's really what I'm doing. Right. So uh, we have time and I, uh, I want to discuss with you, I, I wanted to discuss lots of other things, you know, especially your book, Metaphysics of Technology, but since we only have 25 minutes more now, I think we should discuss uh, Jesus. Um, you argue, again, you will, in, even in this instance, you are in a minority in arguing that uh, Jesus did not exist at all for the mythicist to you. So how did that come about? Like, is it because, are you an atheist? Is, is that? Well, no. Does, I don't, did I don't that influence you? Yeah, no, I don't, I don't call myself an atheist. So I'm more of a. Well, non-Christian. Yeah, certainly non-Christian, obviously. Um, yeah, I mean, right. So the, the basic problem, when you start to look at the details from an objective standpoint of the Christian story and the Bible and the New Testament, and anybody who looks at it, especially with a knowledge of the history of what we know about, about these documents, it, you immediately realize there are some major problems. Um, you know, the sort of the short version of, 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 of the argument is, uh, well, look, we have this guy, Jesus, and we think we know when he lived. And stories are told of these great miracles that he did. So he raised people from the dead. He walked on water. He calms the storm. He feeds 5,000 people with, you know, two loaves of bread and so forth. So the problem is, if these things happened, there should be lots of evidence from that time that those things occurred. So we should have writings or letters or uh, inscriptions or something, documents, tangible documents, uh, that these things happened because they happened 
it wasn't in complete wilderness. It was in cities and villages, and it was an area controlled by the Roman Empire. Um, so people were around. People knew what was going on. Some of the, you know, the, the teachings were going on even in Jerusalem, which was a major city. So the problem is we have nothing. We have absolutely nothing from the time of Jesus, from his whole lifetime, which was roughly the year zero to the year 30 AD. We have nothing. Not one shred of evidence, not a letter, not an engraving, not one inscription, nothing. For 20 years after he was crucified, 20 more years, we have nothing. Not one letter, not one story, not one document, nothing. The next 20 years, from the years 50 to 70, we have five or six letters from one person, Paul. Paul. Paul of St. Paul, Paul of Tarsus. A handful of letters, literally five or six, by one man who's, who doesn't talk about the miracles. He just says, well, there was this guy, Jesus, and he was raised from the dead, and he's, he, uh, you know, follow his example, and you can have eternal life. A very simple scheme, five or six letters. So this is, this is for decades after Jesus is gone. So we're thinking, well, wh wh what's going on here? Why is this the case, right? What about all the great miracle stories? Well, those only show up in the Gospels, the four Gospels. We know we have the four Gospels of the Christian story, Gospel of Mark, Matthew, Luke, and John. These were written after Paul's letters, after Paul is dead, in the, in the 70s and the 80s and the 90s A.D., from the best we can tell, from our best experts. It's, it's debatable, but the best experts, the consensus is these were written in these years. These were decades after these miracles supposedly happened. Um, so you have to say, well, look, well, how accurate will this be? You're living in a, in a, in a relatively uh, you know, poor setting. There's obviously no documentation. There's no, there's no records of per se. There's no video. There's obviously nothing, no recordings of anything. All you have is stories and, and tales and, you know, talk and mythology or whatever from, from decades old that suddenly someone, for some reason, starts to write down decades after. And you say, well, look, these guys could not have known what happened because there was no evidence at the time when Jesus lived. Probably they did not happen. The most obvious conclusion is, look, there were no miracles. There was no walking on water. There was no raising from the dead. This is obvious today, I think, for most people. But here you have men. These were uh, Jewish men in the 70s and 80s. And they were writing as if the miracles did happen and that they were real and they were true. So my obvious conclusion is, well, look, they're, they're making up a false story. They're telling you something which was false. They're telling you it was true something that, that, that did not happen, they're telling you it did happen and that you have to believe it and then you get to go to heaven. So to me, I'm like, no, no, this, this is not how it works. This is a bogus story, a fake story that's being constructed and portrayed as truth for a particular reason to, in a sense, to deceive the masses. There's a story behind it. It's in my book, The Jesus Hoax, if people are interested. Uh, you can sort of read the story. It's basically because the Jews were uh, oppressed by the Roman Empire. The Romans moved into Palestine in the year 63 BC, many decades before. And the Jews had a very good reason to try to undermine the Roman rule, to try to get back at the Romans, to defeat the Roman ideology or the, the mythology of Rome. And one way to do this was to create a new uh, uh, quasi-Jewish theology based on a miracle man who did not exist. And we'll write the stories about the miracle man. And, and he was a Jewish rabbi named Jesus. And he believed in the Jewish God, which was Jehovah. And we'll write the stories about him as if they were true. And then we'll pass them around to the masses and try to get them to, to follow this story. So to me, this is really what happened. It was really a constructed religion, a constructed theology for a particular reason to sort of undermine the Roman worldview, the Roman religion per se, uh, by the local a handful of Jewish elite in, in uh, Palestine. 
And that was the, the basis of the hoax. That's why it was a kind of a hoax, a, a kind of a lie or a fraud that they constructed. Okay, let me play the devil's advocate and make the case for the existence of Jesus. So you talked about miracles. Now, Jesus may, I think that Jesus did not commit the miracles, but it's quite probable that says nothing about his existence as a whole. He might have just been a preacher who said certain things which were mentioned in the New Testament, but did not, you know, the likelihood of him committing miracles is, of course, it's extremely unlikely. And also because we have very little documentation from the time Jesus lived of people who were actually quite famous. I mean, Jesus was a very lower class uh, Jewish uh, person from a very, you know, relatively unknown, but even influential people of that time uh, in the first century um, Palestine, like Josephus or uh, Pontius Pilate, we still have very little uh, documentation of their existence, but we still, you know, think that they exist. Caiaphas, we don't have, uh, we have very little documentation of his existence. And um, also people at that time were extremely uh, illiterate, like around 10% of them were uh, literate. So not everything was as documented. It was mostly oral tradition, but we do have um, from the time that uh, within a century of Jesus's death, uh, documentation from non-Christian sources about his existence. Uh, we have Josephus, uh, most famously. We have uh, Justin of Tiberius. We have Pliny the Younger. So all of these people did not have to prove the existence of Jesus because they were not believers in him. In fact, Josephus refers to him mockingly in one of the instances, the other one's a bit less believable. Um, so, and we know that uh, James, the brother of Jesus, there is existence that he uh, did exist. So uh, given these facts, how are you going to, what is your response? Well, right. So um, probably there was an actual person. I actually believe that there was an actual person, probably a Jesus of Naz Nazareth. He was a Jewish rabbi, probably. He probably was a kind of a social advocate for the poor. He probably opposed the Roman rule, probably spoke against the Romans on behalf of the local Jews uh, in, the, in the area, probably got them agitated, worked up, wanted done them to maybe sort of a fight or oppose the Romans, probably got enough attention that he was arrested and probably crucified, uh, more or less like we hear in the Bible. So th this is perfectly fine. I have no problem with this. You know, Jesus as a as a, a preacher and a social advocate, who got into trouble with the Romans, got arrested, got crucified. This was a this was a typical Roman punishment. You would typically crucify people who were political opponents, like uh, insurrectionists or uh, social advo uh, advocates for the local people. Um, so this is perfectly fine. Um, what, and, and even that would not, you would not expect documentation because they, they're not going to write books and stories about every criminal who gets, you know, gets himself crucified. Uh, it was just, it was not done back then. But, but, but the Jesus of the Bible is a completely different story. So this is the son of God, or maybe God himself comes to earth, not just a great hero, not just a great teacher. He's doing miracles and lots of them, dozens. There's like 36 miracles uh, attributed to Jesus in the New Testament. I document them in my book, The Jesus Hoax. Um, again, major miracles, raising people from the dead, touching them and healing their, you know, their, their afflictions and calming storms. And, and you know, like I say, feeding 5,000 people with two loaves of bread and a few fish. Um, I mean, if this is really, these miracles are really happening, this person really is the son of God, this must have attracted attention by somebody. It would have attracted attention by his followers, by his opponents, and by the Romans who were there watching what's going on. They're, they're watching the people. This is, what, this is what Pontius Pilate's job is to do. He's the governor of the territory of Palestine. And his job is to 
um, uh, his job is to is to keep control of these Jewish tribes and to, to manage them and to know what's going on. So certainly this this would have been common knowledge. It would have been documented. It would have been uh, there would have been a record. It's impossible. I mean, you had people who were writing. There were famous writers at the time. Uh, uh, what was it? Seneca and Philo was there writing, writing volumes. I mean, they were well-informed, literate people who were writing lots of things about this time. We have those documents. But the documents of the time, there's nothing. Zero mention of this Jesus. No mention of the Son of God, of the miracles. The writings that we have, you mentioned from Josephus, is the first non-Christian writing. This is from the year 93. This is like decades after. Jesus is done, gone, buried, he's history, and then Josephus writes one paragraph in a book that says, well, there's this group called the Christians, and they follow this guy, Jesus. Well, that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. Yeah, there was a group of people. They followed this guy, Jesus. I have no problem with that. Same with Tacitus and Pliny. They're writing, they're saying, look, there's a group of people who call themselves Christians, and they're troublemakers, and blah, blah, blah. Well, that's fine. That says not, that does, gives no credence to the story itself that the guy actually existed and then he actually did those miracles. Well, I think that argument is much closer to the uh, Bart Ehrman sort of view than the uh, Robert Price, Richard Karen Mutisa sort of view, which is that um, Bart Ehrman agrees that um, Jesus existed. He did not um, did those miracles or was not um, the person that is portrayed in the Bible in the exact sense, but he did, you know, sort of exist. And you seem to be uh, kind of conceding that point and rather arguing for that he did not commit miracles. Well, uh, uh, in, in that sense, you're not saying that the historical Jesus, as it were, did not exist. You're essentially saying that Jesus uh, did not did those miracles and that it is likely that he was just a preacher. So, um, then, then, but I have seen you argue for the mythicist point of view. So I'm, I'm sort of confused about where exactly you stand now. Uh, well, I mean, even the mythicists have different views, as you say, right? Some, some think there was a, a man named Jesus. Some think he was a complete fiction or just completely made up construction. And they have different, different arguments. Um, I, I don't even know all the different arguments. I know they have different positions. Um, but, but I guess the point is they don't really have any good reason to believe in this historical Jesus, the man, Jesus, because there's zero evidence. My, my little theory is that, look, if you're constructing a hoax or a fraud, it works much better if you base it on a little bit of truth, right? Everybody knows if you're going to make a lie, it's best to start with a little bit of truth and then you build your lie around the truth. So probably my, my idea is thinking is that, well, look, Paul, because he was the first to do the writings, probably Paul is thinking back a few years in the past, oh, there was a fellow named Jesus. Yeah, he was a real guy and the people liked him and he got himself crucified. What if we make, what if we, what if I turn him into something else? What if I say he made miracles? What if I say he's the son of God, you know? So they take a really, a real person which makes your hoax believable because people say, yeah, I remember that Jesus guy. Yeah, he was a great teacher. I remember when he was crucified or whatever, right? So your hoax works better if it's based on a real person than on no one at all. So to me, that's the best reason to think that the person actually existed because it makes the hoax work better. And I think that's probably, that would probably make perfect sense to Paul and to the gospel writers. They would take a little bit of truth an actual guy who actually got crucified and make the story around him. That's the most plausible outcome. Now I can't prove it because I have no evidence because there's zero evidence that he existed at all. Maybe it was complete fiction. It doesn't matter to me. To me, my hoax theory still works. They still made a lie. They still told people it was true. It was really nonsense. It doesn't really matter if the lie was based on an actual person or on no person at all. The, the lie is slightly different but it's still a lie, if you see what I mean. Yeah, I think that I, is the I'm, okay. Can, can, yeah. can we pause for one second? Can we pause for one second? I have a workman uh, here and I have to. Yes. So I was just saying that, uh, you know, your, what you said is true, essentially true of every 
religion in the world you know every religion in the world has to say myth and is based on a certain sliver of historicity especially with it you know like the case of buddha for instance uh, it's quite likely that he existed but not that his teachings were what uh, is mentioned in this sort of ancient text because those happen to be contradictory like the story of jesus so uh, i'll let you go and uh, it was great talking to you and uh, viewers can find your work, uh, the metaphysics. If you're interested in exploring Dr. Skrbinski's work, you can read Skrbina's work, you can read the metaphysics of technology and uh, his collaboration with David, uh, Ted Kaczynski and uh, his work on panpsychism. You can also watch uh, the Netflix documentary, Una Bomber, uh, where Dr. Skrbina uh, is one of the interviewers. Uh, I had a great time talking with you and hopefully we'll do this again. Thank you. Yeah, for again, I would, I would just mention my, I have my personal website. So that's davidskrbina.com. So if people are interested, they can go there. They can find all the books that I have and some of the other writings and some links to videos and so forth. So uh, that's a good source also. Yep, and you can contact Dr. Skrbina through email. So yes. thank you very much for doing this. Okay, Anwish, thank you.